Breaking tonight, a stunning revelation from the latest WikiLeaks document dump that has key Hillary Clinton staffers now taking heat over an email exchange that lashes out at two major faith groups. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. We are seeing a growing amount of angry reaction in the last few hours as folks become aware of a leaked 2011 email chain between a trio of Hillary Clinton acolytes. Jennifer Palmieri, Clinton's current communications director, John Podesta, Clinton's current campaign chair, and John Halpin, a senior fellow at the left-leaning Center for American Progress think tank. First, Catholicism is slammed, and then all of evangelical Christianity. At one point, John Halpin writes his colleagues about conservatives and the church, writing, quote, it's an amazing bastardization of the faith. They must be attracted to the systemic thought and severely backwards gender relations. Clinton campaign manager John Podesta describes himself as a practicing Catholic. He does not respond directly to the conversation in the documents we have, but we're still waiting to hear the campaign's explanation for all of this. In moments, we'll be joined by noted evangelical leader Tony Perkins from the Family Research Council and then Karl Rove on the possible fallout politically. But we begin tonight with Trace Gallagher for the very latest on this breaking news live from our West Coast newsroom. Trace? Megan, the indication from these Catholic bashing emails is that both Rupert Murdoch and the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, Robert Thompson, decided to raise their children Catholic, not because of their religious beliefs, but rather for social and political benefits. Mark Halpin writes, Robert Halpin writes, quote, it's an amazing bastardization of the faith. They must be attracted to the systemic thought and severely backwards gender relations and must be totally unaware of Christian democracy. Top Clinton aide John Podesta, who again as Catholic did not respond, Jen Palmieri did, writing, quote, I imagine they think it is the most socially acceptable politically conservative religion. Their rich friends wouldn't understand if they became evangelicals. Halpin writes back, quoting, excellent point. They can throw around to mystic thought and subsidiarity and sound sophisticated because no one knows what the hell they're talking about. To mystic thought is the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, subsidiarity, the belief that things are better handled at a local level instead of a central government. The Catholic League responded to the email saying, quote, these anti-Catholic remarks are bad enough, but it makes one wonder what else Clinton's chiefs and others associated with the campaign are saying about Catholics and Catholicism. We should point out this is a religious group the Clinton campaign should covet. A poll from the Public Religion Research Institute showed that likely Catholic voters favored Hillary Clinton over Trump 55% to 34%. And a Georgetown study shows that in the past 16 presidential elections, Catholics have voted Republican only three times, once for Nixon, twice for Reagan. Again, we emailed the Clinton campaign for a response. So far, nothing. Trace, thank you. Joining me now with more, President of the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins. Tony, good to see you again. And so the, the hostility, the hostility toward Christians in this, and, and in the, the one paragraph, in particular Catholics, uh, as this man describes as bastardizing the faith and, and dismissing the entire Catholic belief system as severely backwards, uh, when it comes to gender relations, and on and on he goes. And Clinton's campaign communications director seems to agree wholeheartedly. Megan, this should be no surprise to those who listen to what Hillary Clinton says. Remember, this is the same Elitis Vineyard that gave us the term basket of deplorables. Uh, used going further even to say that they're irredeemable, which obviously is a concept that stands in stark contrast to what evangelicals and Catholics believe as they, yes, they believe and cling to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. This is tr this should be troubling uh, to people that, that see that they believe that people who actually want to live by their faith are somehow backwater people. Mm -hmm. Look, there's a lot of Americans who literally simply want to live their lives according to their faith, and it's clear that Hillary Clinton and her team uh, hold them in disdain. The thing that seems to really horrify them in this email exchange is that Rupert Murdoch, the owner of this channel, and Robert Thompson, head of News Corp, that, that they had the nerve to baptize their children Catholic and want to raise them Catholic, which has these officials 
who want the Catholic vote. The Catholic vote has actually proven very important for Democrats in past elections. Uh, hold in disdain. They're disgusted by it. They, I mean, they, they can't believe that they would want to baptize and raise a baby Catholic. Well, that's stuff people in the flyover states do, not people in sophisticated places do, according to them. Again, this is where Hillary Clinton talks about the freedom to worship. It's okay if you just kind of go to church and treat it as a social club, a, a glorified social club, but if you literally want to teach your children these principles, live your life according to that, you're going to run in trouble, into trouble with Hillary Clinton. And I well, think but it's not her. I mean, in fairness to Hillary, it's not her. It's her campaign chairman who doesn't uh, weigh in, but it's her communications director and this other guy at Center for American Progress. Look, let me tell you, I'm not going to allow a communication director for me to speak about something in a way that is not consistent with what I believe. I, look, this is the same campaign that gave birth out of the mouth of Hillary Clinton the term deplorables, irredeemable, talking about uh, Trump supporters who are evangelicals and social, socially conservative Catholics. This is troubling, should be troubling politically for her, not because these evangelicals, maybe the Catholics, not the evangelicals are going to vote for her, but it shows the hostility toward religious freedom, and that is what where these evangelicals are right now, mm -hmm. uncertain about Trump, but now they see the hostility from Hillary Clinton, that mm -hmm. their religious freedom is at stake in this election. She was raised Methodist, although she doesn't, doesn't appear to be a practicing um, Methodist because she doesn't go to church and so on, but you can see certainly how, th how those around her <laughs> feel about practicing Catholics or those who have the nerve to actually baptize their children. Tony, good to see you. Thanks, Megan. Also here on this breaking story, Fox News contributor and former Deputy Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush, Carl Rove. Carl, good to see you. You tell me whether Jen Palmieri and, and you know this other guy is not with the Clinton campaign, but Jen Palmieri w weighs in and, and adds her own two cents, ridiculing Catholics ought to come out with an apology to this voting bloc, which is almost as powerful as the African-American vote and many others. Well, look, roughly a quarter of the electorate are Catholics. It's the largest swing group. Contrary to, just slightly to what Trace said earlier, if you look at the exit polls, since 1972, Catholics, with one exception, have voted in each and every presidential election for the ultimate winner. The one exception was 2000 when they voted for Al Gore in the exit polls by 50 to 47. But even that was an extraordinary gain for Bush who got 10 points more among Catholics than Bob Dole's 37 percent. So they play a critical role in the election. Now, will this become a political issue? I think it all depends upon whether or not both politically interested Catholics and more importantly the Trump campaign make it an issue. This was re thinly veiled religious bigotry, not only against conservative Catholics, but also against evangelicals. Sort of the back and forth is, is they're, they're conservative Catholics because they couldn't take the social pressure of being evangelicals, because mm -hmm. that is even more out of the mainstream. Right, because so that's even more was, disgusting. It, yeah, so the question is, is rather than talking about Paul Ryan, tomorrow, who is incidentally a Catholic, what about tomorrow if Donald Trump stands up and, and takes a whack at th these comments and calls upon uh, the campaign and the campaign officials in question to both repudiate him and apologize? I mean, this is the only way it's going to become an issue. In 2000, we had a very active Catholic organization that could have spread this word and made it an issue in every critical battleground state. I don't sense that that's the case in, in the Trump campaign this year around. It'll take him to make it an issue. This woman, Jen Palmieri, is very, she's high up in the Clinton campaign. This is not sure. some minion. One of her key lieutenants. And you tell me what the Clinton team would be doing to the Trump team if Kellyanne Conway or any of the inner circle came out and said something this disdainful of an entire voting block, whether it was, I mean, yeah. you know, put the shoe on the other foot, right? If they said something about yeah, gays absolutely. or if they put so, you know, something that a voting block that they consider uh, in their column, they'd be going nuts on it. And you, they'd be yeah, demanding they an apology. Exactly. Well, look, and they mock the deep held beliefs. They mock the idea that two conservative Catholics would have their <clears throat> children baptized in the same river where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. I mean, this is really amazing that they would mock them for, I mean, what Christians would consider it a, a would, wouldn't consider it a blessing to be able to uh, f be able to afford to baptize their children in the Jordan River? I mean, this this is a is so insensitive. I, I'm going to say that it's insensitive, but it really strikes me that it borders on bigotry, religious bigotry. But the question is, the question you started with is, is it going to be a political issue? Mm -hmm. It depends upon whether or not Donald Trump 
intends to make it a political issue. Well, remember issue, this, Carl. That Re- means remember in the, in, the, in the 2008 election when Barack Obama was running, this became an issue for the Democrats then because he was caught on tape referring to those who are religious as bitter clingers. It's the bitter clingers side right. that became so infamous. I think right. we have it. Listen. And they feel so betrayed by government. Well, that's surprising then that they get bitter. They cling to guns or religion or uh, antipathy towards people who aren't like that person. So, and, and that was not helpful. That was not particularly helpful to Barack Obama's campaign. Right. Not at all. Not at all. But but look, do you think the media, without some prodding, without somebody making it an issue, that most of the media is going to pay attention to this? Most of the media is secular. Most of the media doesn't claim to understand or care to understand the deeply held beliefs of people of faith. And so it, it, we can't count on NBC and ABC and CBS, the, the producers and the, and the news directors saying, oh, this is a story worth covering. No, no. It's going to have to be made an issue by... Donald Trump and his allies mm-hmm. stepping forward and saying this is unacceptable, and Hillary Clinton ought to repudiate she, it. She's and been Jim out Powell there. Ought to, ought to. Hillary has been out there condemning Donald Trump's comments about Muslims, calling for religious tolerance, saying that she's been an advocate her whole life for religious freedom, and now the question is, what is she going to do, and what is her communications yeah. director going to do when she is caught having this kind of an exchange right. about this no, this many millions of Americans yeah. who have deeply held, deeply held, honest, sincere beliefs that right. she's in no right. position to judge. Carl, we'll wait to see. What about some religious respect in addition to tolerance? So what about some respect for the beliefs of people? Mm-hmm. Great to see you. Well, we're waiting for comments. We're waiting for some sort of remark back from them. Look, this is these are hacked documents, right? This, is, this comes from the WikiLeaks dump, so it's controversial. But so is the content. And you ask yourself, ask yourself what the Clinton team would be doing right now if this kind of thing came out from Team Trump. In the meantime, we're watching Donald Trump tonight to see if he speaks to any of the breaking news tonight down in uh, Panama City Beach, Florida, before we'll be joined by Trump spokesperson Katrina Pearson and former Romney campaign chief strategist Stu Stevens, who will be talking about the road ahead to the next big debate. Plus, leaked emails are raising questions about whether uh, suggesting former CNN contributor Donna Brazil sent the Clinton team inside information ahead of questions at a candidate town hall. Howard Kurtz just spoke to Brazil. He'll join us live with the breaking news. And with a number of media outlets now giving Bill and Hillary the fact check treatment, Judge Andrew Napolitano reviews the record for us tonight. Stay tuned. Mr. Trump may have said some bad words, but Bill Clinton raped me and Hillary Clinton threatened me. I don't think there's any comparison. Breaking tonight, 28 days now from the election. 28 days. And a new poll showing how Americans reacted to the second presidential debate. The Wall Street Journal survey was conducted one day after the release of a leaked video showing Mr. Trump making stunning remarks about women on a bus. And it showed Donald Trump going into the Sunday debate trailing Hillary Clinton by 11 points. Then on Monday after the debate, they polled again. And Mr. Trump had improved by two points, suggesting the worst of the damage from that tape may have been accounted for. Tonight, Mr. Trump is in Florida, expected to hit the Clinton camp on the latest WikiLeaks revelations. In moments, we'll be joined by Stu Stevens, former chief strategist for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. But we begin tonight with Katrina Pearson, Trump campaign national spokesperson. Katrina, good to see you. Uh, Frank, can I just get your reaction to that that story about the, the Catholic bashing? You know, this is not something that, you know, is news to us. We've known Miss uh, Miss Clinton has had issues with many Americans, and Mr. Trump even said it at the debate, Megan. He said she has hatred in her heart, and yes, these are her staffers, but this is a direct reflection of her. We've seen it in the way that she's addressed many other Americans here recently. All right, but let, let me ask you whether you think it makes any difference at this point, because we're 28 days, da- days out. Trump went up two points from the debate, but there is still a nine-point gap between the two of them and you know at this point in the 2012 election we're going to talk to Romney's guys Stu Stewart's in a a moment Romney was up by one and he still lost handily Trump's down by nine 
Well, in one of these polls you, you mentioned earlier, we're looking at what a six to seven point margin of error. So I'll take that. Mr. Trump has closed a similar polls. gap you in one week. You and the Trump week. team in love one week. the polls. You can't reject the ones. Well, they are a snapshot that, that in we time. Present and, to you just because and you they're know, bad we for realize him. that. <laughs> well, no, they are a snapshot in time. We realize that. But as I just said, Mr. Trump has been able to close large gaps within one week, and that's exactly what's going to happen. This isn't going to be like a 2012. We have a candidate that's willing to fight for it. Not like the 2012 campaign, Mr. Trump is going to come out swinging, which is exactly what he's done today. What we is have he a fantastic doing to new add? ad that's what's out. It, what is he doing to add to his support base, which we understand is with him? Well, he's talking about his vision. He is actually prosecuting the case against Hillary Clinton. Uh, you saw that at the debate as well. And that's why so many people in your, in your uh, Frank Luntz's uh, group that you had, the focus group, said that Mr. Trump won that debate and won some people over. That is very important. It's extremely important for Mr. Trump to continue to outline the differences between he and Hillary Clinton and their policies, and more importantly, her failures after being in elected office for 30 years between herself and her husband. Is there any truth, Katrina, to the Wall Street Journal report tonight that, that what Trump is actually trying to do now in these l next 28 days, we've got four weeks to Election Day, is to drive down turnout for her, to, to depress enthusiasm on the Democratic side, understanding that he's not going to get that many swing voters in the middle. He's going to get his base, and he's trying to make her base be smaller than his base. No, not at all. I mean, the, the, the media is always trying to create the Trump narrative. Mr. Trump is fighting for every vote, even those that we know we might not win. He's still going to fight for that. We look at a poll in Texas. A CBS poll has Mr. Trump at 20% African-American support in the state of Texas. Mr. Trump is reaching some of those he people, though they may not be Texas. showing up in the polls. He's this running is as a Republican. A, no, African-Americans. African-Americans. That's a big difference. He's doing extremely well with a lot of these people that aren't showing up in the polls. And we do see his numbers continue to grow at his rallies. Those people are going to vote, just as they, they talked about in the primary, that these big rallies won't turn into votes. And he broke records. Okay. We're going to continue to see it. This is a movement. This is not a campaign. Okay. Great to see you. Also today, Donald Trump's campaign rolling out a brutal new pol political ad hitting Hillary Clinton. Watch. Our next president faces daunting challenges in a dangerous world. Iran promoting terrorism, North Korea threatening, ISIS on the rise, Libya and North Africa in chaos. Hillary Clinton failed every single time as Secretary of State. Now she wants to be president. Hillary Clinton doesn't have the fortitude, strength, or stamina to lead in our world. She failed as Secretary of State. Don't let her fail us again. Joining us now is Stu Stevens, former chief strategist for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign and founding partner at Strategic Partners and Media. So let me just start with you before we get to that ad where I left off with Katrina on, the, on where Romney was this time four years ago and just how bad you think the nine-point gulf is. Well, it's bad. Um, the, the more telling thing, I think, is that the two groups that Trump needs to get back into this race is Republicans. Any nominee has to get over 90 percent of their own party to be in the, in the game. Otherwise, you're running out on the Super Bowl field with eight players instead of 11. And he needs suburban women. Uh, particularly college-educated women. No Republican has lost college-educated white voters since the FDR era. I mean, Barry Goldwater won college-educated white voters, and Trump is losing them. So, he, to get into the game, he needs as many Republicans as he can get, and he needs as many uh, well-educated women, uh, suburban women in particular, in places like Philadelphia. And what's he doing? He's, he's <laughs> today attacking Republicans, and this this attack on Hillary Clinton, I think, just turns off a lot of women that he needs to get the vote for. Just him. so the viewers know what we're talking about, he sent out, he went on a tweet storm this morning, I heard just a couple examples. Uh, it's so nice that the shackles have been taken off me and I can now fight for America the way I want to. And then he takes aim at Republicans, saying, disloyal Republicans, or ours, are far more difficult than crooked Hillary. They come at you from all sides. They don't know how to win. I will teach them. And that's just a couple there that he went on from there, Stu. Yeah, it's, it's a, a curious strategy for bringing a party together, which party unity is an essential element of winning in our two-party system. Um, I get that Donald Trump uh, doesn't like everybody in the Republican Party and vice versa, but it's up to him as the head of the ticket to try to bring people together instead of 
being divisive. Do you? Do, um, so what? What do you think? I mean, give us your take on the on the last debate. You know, which he he says all the polls say that he won, which is not true. But uh, uh, you know, so, some people do definitely believe Trump won that debate, and he certainly did much better in the eyes of many uh, than at the first debate. You have a different take. Yeah, I, I thought Trump spoke to his base too much in that debate. I mean, really. A, a, a debate is an opportunity to reach voters in a w way that you can't reach them through any other means and voters who you need to get to join you. It's not just to pump up your own voters. So if you look at it, that what he really needed were female voters, uh, particularly these, these better educated uh, women. I, I just think it was sort of a disaster for him in that regard. Um, everything from his manner to that sort of strange half apology at the beginning uh, to this the stun of bringing out the, the Bill Clinton accusers. I, I just think it, the, the idea of a, trying to attack a woman for infidelities of her husband, I just think rubs a lot of well, people. Well, you know, they say it's for her role. Way. It's for her role. It's sort of the, the offender and then the yeah. cleanup crew. I'm glad I don't have to try to spin that. I just don't think it's it's something that the difference between that is so fine and I get it um, but it just I don't think the total impression is uh, that he's really right, blaming her question. for Bill Clinton final question can he turn it around any chance I mean what are the odds that he can turn this around well you know politics is always about probability and probability is based on what has happened can he turn it around sure of course um, is Hillary Clinton the better bet yes mm-hmm he turned it around after the Democratic National Convention. They were running neck and neck, and then came Alicia Machado uh, and some other incidents that have now been well publicized. Stuart, great to see you. Good to see you. And in just nine days, for the first time ever, a Fox News anchor will be moderating a general election presidential debate, and we are very proud of our own Chris Wallace. Widely regarded as one of the best questioners in the business. He will moderate the all-important final debate between Trump and Clinton. This make-or-break event, less than three weeks before the historic election of 2016, will be held, oh, where else? In Vegas, baby! October 19th. And the best place to watch the Fox-moderated debate is right here on the Fox News Channel. And then stay tuned for The Kelly File, live at 11 p.m. with complete wrap-up and analysis of the night's biggest moments. Don't miss it. Also tonight, several media outlets starting to question the stories of the women accusing Bill Clinton of sexual assault and accusing Hillary Clinton of helping with the cover-up and the aftermath. Judge Andrew Napolitano is here to review the record. Plus, leaked emails are raising questions about whether CNN contributor Donna Brazile sent the Clinton team inside information ahead of the questions at a candidate town hall. Howie Kurtz just got off the phone with Brazil. He's now here, and he will tell us what the now head of the DNC had to say. Plus, we'll have reaction from Dana Lash and Richard Fowler on a busy night. Don't go away. This crooked media, you talk about crooked Hillary, they're worse than she is. They are so dishonest. Without the media, without the media, Hillary Clinton couldn't be elected dog catcher. I mean that. It's true. It's true. From the start of his campaign, right up until last night, Donald Trump has consistently accused the media of working against him. Now WikiLeaks has uncovered a number of emails that suggest perhaps there may have been some coordination between some well-known folks on TV and some high-ranking members of the Clinton campaign. We asked Howie Kurtz to investigate that charge. He's the host of Media Buzz on the Fox News Channel. Howie, what'd you find? Hi, Megan. Well, the latest batch of hacked emails disclosed by WikiLeaks is causing headaches not just for candidates, but for journalists and commentators. Donna Brazil, the acting Democratic Party chair, is in hot water tonight over an incident last March when she was a CNN contributor. Brazil was the DNC's vice chair while working at CNN, but has temporarily suspended her network contract for now. The day before a CNN town hall with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, Brazil wrote the Clinton campaign, from time to time I get the questions in advance. Here's one that worries me about HRC. It involved the death penalty with Brazil citing these statistics. 156 people have been on death row and later set free. Since 1976, 1,414 people have been executed in the U.S. And this was the town hall question. Since, 
since 1976, we've executed 1,414 people in this country. Since 1973, 156 who were convicted have been exonerated from the death row. A CNN spokesman told us no contributors get questions beforehand, and Donna Brazil told me moments ago she's not sure about the reference in her email, but that, quote, contributors, even analysts, get nowhere near that process. I wasn't involved. I'm never involved. I find it flabbergasting. It's ridiculous. So what's described in an illegally hacked email can sometimes be more ambiguous in real life, especially when a cable commentator doubles as a top party official. It's not unusual for partisan commentators to check in with campaigns, but any sharing of questions before an event would be a journalistic breach. The WikiLeaks stump also includes John Harwood, CNBC's Washington bureau chief, who drew plenty of negative reviews last year for the way he treated Donald Trump as a debate moderator. Let's be honest. Is this a comic book version of a presidential no, campaign? A I talked to economic advisors who have served presidents of both parties. They said that you have as much chance of cutting taxes that much without increasing the deficit as you would of flying away from that podium by flapping your arms. Now we learn that weeks after that debate, Harwood chastised the Republicans in an email to Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, quote, I imagine that Obama feels some sad vindication at this demonstration of his years-long point about the opposition party veering off the rails. I certainly am feeling that way with respect to how I questioned Trump at our debate. And in a message to Podesta after the Clinton email scandal broke, Harwood included a tweet he had posted, set aside process, if there's any specific, plausible suggestion of nefarious email Hillary Clinton was trying to hide, I haven't heard it. But Harwood and reporters like him attempt to build relationships with campaign officials to get scoops and interviews. And Harwood did try to book Podesta for CNBC. Megan. Howie, thank you. Joining us now with more, Dana Lash, host of Dana on the Blaze TV, and Richard Fowler, a Fox News contributor now, yay, and nationally syndicated radio talk show host. Great, great to have you both. Uh, Good so to be here, Megan. Let's talk about this. Now, the, the thing with Brazil, I mean, I'll tell you this, as, as a debate moderator myself, I, I cannot imagine anyone at CNN ever leaking a question to anyone. I mean, it would be the height of unethical. I just, I can't imagine it. And yet, the question, you know, as asked, and what was in that email, Dana, was almost verbatim. That it's, it's a remarkable coincidence, isn't it, Megan? I, the thing is, is I, I'm with you. I mean, I can't imagine someone leaking it, but at the same time, it's Occam's razor. You can't sit here and deny the obvious. The question was almost identical to the one that was asked at the town hall. And it's not beyond the realm of possibility to think that perhaps maybe Donna Brazile was able to obtain this question in advance. And then, of course, I mean, she's the head of the party. She's going to pass that off to the she party's wasn't nominee, then, Hillary Clinton. But she was Clinton. a Democrat. She, she wasn't the head of the right. party, though. But she was a Democrat. No. You know, Not Richard, then, but she did become it. I just for kicks, I did. I googled the language, and it does pull up uh, the Equal Justice Initiative, which has almost exactly the same language, saying since 1973, 156 people have been released from death row after evidence of their innocence was uncovered. So this may be boilerplate language that you know death penalty opponents have on their websites. We we don't have proof to show collusion. Uh, we don't, Megan, and, I, and let me tell you, let me be very frank on this one. I know Donna Brazil very, very, very well, and I just, there's no, there's no strict information that Donna would ever do anything like this, which is the reason why the party chose her to be the interim chair uh, after the whole, le the leak with uh, Debbie Washington Schultz. So I, I dismiss this on face just based on the reputation that Donna Brazil has to both me and many people watching tonight. Mm -hmm. But additionally, uh, to a larger perspective, right, so there's this argument constantly pushed by the Trump campaign that we saw in the bump into this segment of the of the media being so crooked and being so awful and being so tainted. But if you look at the numbers, Megan, Donald Trump has got more earned media than any candidate in recent history. But he wants it to be one. favorable. And he wants it to be favorable but, coverage. But here's the thing. Any press is good press, is what you learn in journalism school, right? And number two, and I think wait, the wait. most important point, is if, if the liberal media had so much power, why is it that Republicans still have control of the Congress, they still have control of the Senate, if the media quote-unquote hated George Bush, but he won in 2000, okay. he won in 2004. Go ahead, Dana. Respond to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, you know we don't have the White House, unfortunately, and I think we've been in fighting in spite of media. That's bias. your fault, Look, Dana, not ours. There is. 
No, Let her respond. Not, Go ahead, fact. Dan. Come on, Richard. No, there's absolute <laughs> media bias in network media. You know that as well as I do. There's also left outlets and right outlets that are both equally biased. But here's the thing. it's We've had network news and we've had major publishers of newspapers, etc., that have been biased for a long time. There is absolute proof of media bias. We know this. And it's not just against Trump, Megan. Media has been biased against Republicans, period, for such a long time. The whole vast right-wing conspiracy. Everything that we've seen from the WikiLeaks emails or the, the, the document dumps so far. I mean, we know that there's a bias here. I mean, for crying out loud, we had George Stephanopoulos back in 2012 during the debates insert that answer about birth control, which then flipped the entire general election cycle to become this whole war on women narrative, well, which the, was which was crazy. There's no there's question that there's no question that most of the people in news uh, lean left and that there's a liberal bias baked in. I mean, the news tends to be young. It tends to be a bunch of young people. Yeah, they tend to be they can at least be objective. Hey, just, I, you know, the interesting thing come about on. John Harwood's tweet, can I tell you this, is that he tweeted that you know that stuff about Trump right at a couple weeks after Trump was doing the thing with right. the belt buckle and Ben Carson and his conduct was extremely controversial and in the news in Republican circles and Democrat circles yeah um, and you just never know I, I, like at, you just you don't know whether he's got the same kind of emails to Marco Rubio's campaign to Ted Cruz's campaign we only have a snippet of the perspective here so in defense of my fellow journalists great to see you both Thank Good you, to see you, Megan. Well, with a growing number of media outlets now digging into the stories from Bill Clinton's accusers, who you may have recognized at the presidential debate, we asked Judge Napolitano to help us review the record and separate fact from fiction. He's next. Plus, with a number of news outlets still challenging the Trump team about his 2005 remarks on women, Dr. Ben Carson joins us with his message for the media. Well, a growing number of media outlets are now starting to question the stories of the women who are accusing Bill Clinton of sexual assault and accusing Hillary Clinton of helping to cover it up. We decided to take our own look at the record, and Judge Inter Napolitano is here to help us with that in a moment. But first, Trace Gallagher lays out the case. Trace? Megan, Paula Jones was an Arkansas State employee in 1991 at the Excelsior Hotel in Little Rock. She claims that Bill Clinton then dropped his pants and asked for sex. After years of legal battles, a judge dismissed the case, ruling the allegations, even if true, would not constitute sexual harassment. Clinton agreed to settle the case for $850,000, but Jones' allegations did lead to the discovery of the Monica Lewinsky affair. Then there's Kathleen Willey, a White House aide who claims in 1990 the president put her hand on his genitals, but Willie didn't come forward until five years later when she was subpoenaed in the Paula Jones case. And a friend gave sworn testimony that Willie asked her to lie about the incident. An independent prosecutor said there was insufficient evidence to go forward. Juanita Broderick was initially known as Jane Doe 5 in the Paula Jones case. She gave a sworn affidavit saying she was raped in 1978 by Bill Clinton, but then she appeared to deny the allegation before later changing her story saying she was raped. In 1975, Hillary Clinton defended a man accused of raping 12-year-old Kathy Shelton. As part of her defense, Clinton accused the 12-year-old of being emotionally unstable, fantasizing about older men, and making prior false accusations. It wasn't until 2007 that Kathy Shelton even knew Hillary Clinton was involved in the case, and at the time she had no hard feelings. But in 2014, an audio of Clinton discussing the case and laughing about it went public. Listen. Of course, he quietly did all this stuff. He took a lot of it, Jess. I had to tell her. When she passed, which forever destroyed my faith in politics. And I told him more. Yeah. Clinton came, she wasn't laughing about the case, but about the absurdity of the system. Now Kathy Shelton claims that Hillary Clinton put her through hell because of a psychological exam. But the Washington Post says, yes, Hillary Clinton requested the exam, but a judge denied that request. Shelton to this day maintains that she was examined. Her attacker served less than one year in jail. Mm. Megan. Trace, thank you. Joining me now, Fox News senior judicial analyst and New York Times best-selling author, hello, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Judge, great to see you. Good to be What's with you. What's the name me. of the book? Well, I had a couple that were bestsellers. I think the one they're talking about is called <laughs> Suicide Pact. Okay, good. Just want, want to give you a little promo. Thank you. Um, so how do you... How, these? There's three that we're talking about here right. who are accusing him directly. One who is a rape victim whose 
attacker Hillary defended. The three that are accusing him directly are cases that were never proved or were alleged many, many years after the uh, series of events. Mm -hmm. The only case in which Bill Clinton paid out any money was after the case was dismissed because they feared it would be reinstated and he'd have to go through, he was sitting president at the time, more testimony the in the trial. The Paula Jones settlement to me sounds like a nuisance value settlement. He paid her 850000 the vast majority was legal fees. Correct. Only 200 went to her. Correct. And none of it was his money. It was all raised. Uh, That's what you do to get rid of these behalf. matters when exactly. you're somebody like the president. <laughs> United exactly. States. And I must so we don't know whether these are true. We don't know that they're not true. We all know that they're, we know that they all had serious problems with proof, which is why none of them ever were laid out before a, a judge and jury. Now, both Kathleen Willie and Juanita Broderick refused to come forward for some time publicly and then denied that he had done anything to them for some period of time. That, however, doesn't account for the fact that they may have been intimidated. He was a man of power. They may have been reluctant to do so. But the, where I get held up as a lawyer, you tell me, is that the people want to condemn Hillary with not believing them and with you know, trying to silence them and get rid of them, you know, get them out of the public picture. But there was no proof when she was going after them. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I don't think Hillary is at fault in this case, in any of these cases. Okay, I'm going to fall out of my chair because the judge is defending Hillary. Well, well, listen, we're not talking about emails here. We're talking about a, a, a wife standing by her husband when claims are made against the husband as to which the proof is as you say lacking mm -hmm. claims that were late claims that lacked credibility claims that were partially true claims that were eventually retracted and then reinstated How what about the woman child? wouldn't stand by her husband in that circumstance How about the, the child who Hillary's whose rapist Hillary defended? you know the the file that trace looked at and I looked at showed Hillary Clinton doing a professional job to defend him. She wasn't a serious seasoned criminal defense lawyer, but she did what she had to do, what the law permits. Well, that's a first right here in the Kelly file. Judge Andrew Napolitano, great to see you. Good to be with you, man. Coming up, Ben Carson and Donald Trump's son, Eric Trump. Stay tuned. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just, you know, I don't even wait. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the. <laughs> I can do anything. It's been just four days since those now infamous remarks surfaced, and Eric Trump, the son of Donald Trump, is offering a new defense for his father, telling a Colorado newspaper, "Quote." I think sometimes when guys are together, they get carried away, and sometimes that's what happens when alpha personalities are in the same presence. He went on to say it's not right, it's not the person that he is. Joining me now, Dr. Ben Carson, Trump supporter and former presidential candidate. Dr. Carson, good to see you. You know, you, you also t said this you is too. wrong, but also said it's locker room talk, and that that kind of banter goes on all the time. You tell me, listen, I... I I think there's a real argument to be made that dismissing that kind of talk as just locker room talk and regular banter between alpha males is a very damaging message to be sending to our children, our sons and our daughters today, that, that dismissive tone and nature. Do you disagree with me? Well, well it's not dismissing it. Not, that's not what I'm doing. Uh, it is horrible. There's no excuse for it, and it's not acceptable. Here's the issue. The issue is our country is in a tr tremendous amount of trouble, and we're only a month away from the election. That's true, and but, but the point for, on the other no, no, side no, no, is that if you listen. have a candidate who doesn't, who, who doesn't respect no, no. half of the country, women, that's, that's also an issue. Listen, listen to what I'm saying, because this is critical. The country is mo can move in one of two different directions. The Democrats are going in one direction. The Republicans are going in another direction. Look at their platforms. This is huge. But I don't think the average person recognizes the vast difference between the two directions because they're focusing on this kind of thing. It doesn't mean that it's not important. That's, that's subterfuge when, when everybody comes along and says, this is the most important thing and you can't forget. No, of course it's important, but when you're about to go off the cliff, you've got to take measures to make sure you don't go off the cliff, and then you deal with the other things. 
Do you think Trump was right to go after the Republican Party today? He had just managed. He was down at, I think, 74% uh, of the party was with him after that video. Then he got it up to 89 after the debate, and then he attacks the Republican Party, who he needs to win. Well, you know, it's well known that the, the Republican Party always finds a way to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. Um, hopefully we can avoid it this time. We don't need the infighting. You'll notice that the Democrats disagree too, but yeah. they march lockstep. And it's so important. I wish the, the Republicans could learn that lesson. It's yeah. so critical because they they've got to look at the future. They have 28 days to do so. Dr. Carson, always a pleasure. Thanks for being here. Okay, you too, Megan. We'll be right back. Tonight, I too was raised Catholic and am Catholic, and I talk about my faith in my new book, Settle for More, out November 15th. You can pre order it now, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, lots of behind the scenes stuff about TV news and Fox in general. Check it out.